studio. Welcome in our studio. Hvala. Gospod Korselis bo najprej povedal nekaj uvodnih misli. Will you tell us a few thoughts for beginning, to begin with? About the book? Yes. Yes. This was a part of history that was going rapidly to disappear. Um, one of the major characters in the book, Jorge Janchar, was a, a close friend of mine, and he turned to me once when we were sitting together and said, John, you must get on with this. N nobody lives forever. <laughs> yeah. well, I know you have prepared a speech in Slovenian. Yeah. Can yeah. It, yeah. Yes, yes, please do so. Yes, yes. Um, Koje Knjiga Slovenija, tisač devet sto petin štrzer, iz šla v Londonu. Sem moral začeti s kratkim pozetkom njeni vsebine. Tukaj, v Ljubljani, to ni potrebno. Se znanjeni ste s tem, kar si je dogajalo zadnje dni maja tisač devet sto pet in štirdeset. In veste za tragične, prisilne repatriacije, ter poboje domobrancev, kočevski rog in teharje. Manj je znano pa je to, kaj je tem dogodkom sledila. Izjemni družbeni eksperiment v begunskih taboriščih v Južni Avstriji, ki so nadaljnje tri ali štiri leta nudila zato čišče šest tisoč slovenskim beguncem, ki so za las ušli temu, da bi tudi njih poslali nazaj. V te taborišči se je vsa skupnost povezala in organizirala izobraževanje najvišje kakovosti za vse starosti in vse ravni, vse do vstopa na univerzo. Imali so tudi delavnice za mlade mizarje, kovinarje, krojače, kmete in bolniške sestre. Najna knjiga opisuje vse to s posebne perspektive, kajti jaz sem tam bil in vse to opazoval. Kar sem videl, me je globoko ganilo. Odblizu sem poznal glavne akterje, In imel sem čast, da sem z njimi tesno sodeloval. To je poglavje zgodovine, ki še ni vključeno v knjige, iz katere se današnji učenci učijo zgodovino svoje države. Pa bi moralo biti. To poglavje je del slovenske zgodovine, na katerega je Slovenija lako in tudi mora biti ponosna. To zgodovinsko poglavje ima tudi svoj izjemen ahiv, studija slovenika v škofovi zavodi v Šentvidu, za katerega skrbi Janez Arnež. Thank you. I, I'm impressed. Where did you pick up your Slovenian? Was this in the camp? <laughs> yes. Well, I, I had Slovenes all around me and languages interest me. Spontaneously speak the language because when I open my mouth, a, a Croat term comes out <laughs> rather than Slovene. <laughs> so I, I learned Croat at the age of 21, 22 when, when working with uh, yeah, Croat refugees. Your pronunciation was very good. <laughs> um,
Can you match his language skills, Mr. Ferrar? <laughs> yeah, Teško. <laughs> Teško. <laughs> yes, yes, today go for him, uh, Slovensko, and pak sa mečken. Yes, um, <laughs> drugega razloga. <laughs> Za to, ker imate ženo za Slovenko, Slovenko za ženo, ne? Moja žena je Slovenka, je Evelina, mi dva sva por, porečena in me veseli. In gospa je tudi to knjigo prevedla je, je, v Slovenščino? Ne? Točno. Ok. Now, uh, for a starter, what would you say, like, uh, like John said, ja. from his point of view? Na ena knjiga Slovenija uh, 45 govori o temnem obdobju slovenske zgorovine. Pripoveduje zgodbo o priževetih, ki so emigrirali v Argentinu, v Ameriko, Kanado in Britanijo. Zgorovina postavlja težka moralna vprašanja. And if you don't mind, I'll just carry on in English. Yes, do please. Yes. It, as I said, it's difficult. It's easier, yeah. And uh, that's what really uh, struck me in the first place when I started uh, this, uh, this uh, work with John Corsellas. He invited me how difficult this history and how complicated it, it, it was. Mm. And those of us who come from England, the history was simpler and it was more black and white. Whilst uh, Slovenia was a small uh, country which was occupied during the war by three hostile powers and this created enormous difficulties for, for the people. And so as I worked on this, I found it took me a lot longer. This was like peeling an onion. You take off one layer and then there's another something underneath. You peel off something else and more and more and more. And to understand Slovenian history, I think demands a lot of attention and a lot of respect for the detail, and those of us from outside should refrain from making easy judgments about this. Mm -hmm. And I also gained respect for the moral dilemmas which people uh, were forced into by, by these situations, in particular as there was also the threat of communism which was present uh, during, during the war and which became stronger and stronger, and which many people objected to very strongly. And so many people were forced into practically impossible situations where you have two choices and both of them are wrong in some way. So what do you do? And I think for I myself, I ask myself, what would I have done? Would I have done better? And I'm not sure. Um, John, can you come back to you? At that time you were a young man. 22 years old. Yes, of military, uh, mm -hmm. military years really. But you are not in uniform. No. I was a conscientious objector, a pacifist. A Quaker? Uh, were uh, you a Quaker? A, a Quaker. And, and the Quakers believe uh, that the Bible says we should not kill, and the Bible means we should not kill. Was that possible to be an objective, an objector during the war in, in um, Britain? During the, the First World War, it was quite difficult. By the time of the Second World War, there was a, a surprising degree of tolerance, and, and um, particularly among servicemen. The, the, um, I felt I was conscious of, of no real uh, criticism there. Um, um, women, sometimes, yes, very understandable. Uh, I, I can think of one in particular uh, who, who um, was extremely unhappy uh, to be seen uh, in my company because she, she felt uh, I, I tainted her, I think, there. But, but, but she, she uh, otherwise an excellent person, who, uh, an, a very good refugee worker. So you were a refugee worker then yes. at that time? Mm. Was it a kind of uh, United Nations thing already? No. no. Uh, um, British? No. no, yes, it was um, uh, my unit, it was called the Friends Ambulance Unit. Friends is a, another name for Quakers. And we were uh, attached and working in close collaboration with the British Red Cross. Mm -hmm. You had not only Slovenian refugees, but other nation nationalities too, I think. In, in, many. In the, uh, the major camps in Austria, 
uh, all parts of the uh, of the former Yugoslavia, uh, also um, uh, from the Baltic states, Ukraine, Russia. Uh, it was a, a good mixture, so it, it gave one a lot of practice with one's languages. Yes, but was this by, by choice or by accident that you mostly worked with the Slovenians? Then? Um, very much by choice. Um, I, uh, it, it, was, it was an accident, <laughs> no, it wasn't really an accident there. Um, when I arrived uh, in Solovets, um, there were, they, they knew there were uh, this group of 18,000 or so uh, Slovenes um, at Vetrinia, and we were a small team, and oh yes, Corselis um, speaks. sent him to Vetrin. <laughs> he speaks the language. It was uh, as, sim as simple as that. But although even then I was only sent there half time, the other half the time I was working in Klagenfurt in uh, Bahnhofstrasse in, in a, a quite separate camp which, where, where the majority were, were uh, from, from, from Kochevia, um, Volksdeutsche, who had been expelled. Mm -hmm. Those are the civilians. They are civilians also, yes. But among the 18,000 you mentioned, yes. there were about 12,000 Dombobranci, is that uh, right? Correct, there were. And they were in a different category than the others, than the civilians. Uh, uh, kept quite separate um, in the same enormous field, but, but kept separate. Um, and the team I was working with had no direct contact with them. We were only concerned with the civilians. Were they considered prisoners of war or what? They, they should have been. I mean, technically they certainly were. Because they, they surrendered? They surrendered. Gave up their arms? And uh, that uh, was uh, it. Exactly. Um, and were directed by the British uh, to Vetrinje. Uh, uh, so that, uh, 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 but, sad, sadly, um, the army tr decided to change the rules. And, and they had a, a category of surrendered personnel. And they thought that if you change the name, then you can also change the rules and you can ignore the Geneva Conventions. It, it was a, 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 a great tragedy. And, and one w w which um, l large sections of the army bitterly regret. Mm -hmm. There's always a a dilemma about who really gave the order to, to get those 12,000 people back to Yugoslavia where they expected the worst only f for themselves. Mm -hmm. Was it the, the Supreme Commander? Or the, who was it? Was it uh, Field Marshal Alexander? Was it Winston Churchill in London? Who was it? Um, as far as we know, certainly not Winston Churchill. In fact, he had given uh, um, an opposite order. Uh, that they should, that um, people in that category should not be sent back. Um, the ultimate responsibility must rest with Field Marshal Alexander, but also there's strong reason to believe that uh, his senior political advisor, Harold Macmillan, uh, was also responsible. Harold Macmillan was actually a minister in the British government in London, sent out on detachment to, to the Mediterranean uh, mm -hmm. to advise Alexander um, on all political matters. This was, was rather necessary because Alexander was known to be uh, a, a very brave general and, and a fine military leader but um, fairly naive when it came to uh, political matters. So it was Macmillan? The, uh, um, to the... Um, Nobody really knows. No, nobody really knows, it. exactly. There is a big, big controversy. There was a, a big court case in London on, on the subject, but I, the, um, that, in my opinion, is, is not the final word. And in fact, the people who were involved in the, in the court case said, Court cases are not the best way of deciding yes. history. So what are you saying in the book? The question is still open. We, are, we, we, we try to give a 
a balanced judgment. This is something that I very happily leave in the hands of my, my co-author. <laughs> Yes. I mean, if so, I so just, if I just add, I mean, uh, I think the situation is very confusing uh, in, in Austria for the British Army. And when you look at the various orders which were given, they were quite confusing and contradictory. And it's possible also that the generals on the spot decided to exploit the loopholes in the various orders and send these people back. Maybe Macmillan was also behind it. I can't say that we found definite proof for that. But somebody just decided, let's send these people back, clear them out. We have a lot of problems with the partisans, possibly also with the Russians coming there. We have masses of refugees. We're not equipped in the army to deal with these immediately. So if Tito wants them back, off, he, off they go. Hard decision. It was uh, after a hard war, bitterly fought. People had hard hearts. And uh, whoever took the decision, it was just uh, probably the result mm -hmm. of some dreadful war, a dreadful catastrophe, which made people do things which 50 years later we would never have thought of doing. Your book was well received <coughs> in England. Yes. Uh, I hear that it was sold out last year. When it C uh, correct, yes. Got, got good critical notes and one of... Uh, Uh, for the uh, Times Literary Supplement, was that? Co correct, yes. He, he was one of our leading literary critics. And he... he um, yes. <laughs> yes. But uh, what, what about the government now? They are still uh, keeping yeah. their silence or what? Well, yes. Uh, it's, uh, the, the British government, after, immediately after the war, definitely was deliberately covering this up. Questions were asked in Parliament, and the British government uh, in 1946 outright denied that any Slovene Domobranci had been sent back at all. And that was obviously a lie. Now everybody knows it was, it was not true. Since then, no British government has officially admitted they even sent them back. And both John and I felt that uh, we, as, uh, as Britons, should start looking at history, our own history, but also the Slovene history, in a, a bit more frank and an honest way. This is part of our common history, really. This it is. It yeah. is. And I think as we now all build Europe uh, together, we should join together in looking things a bit more as they were, rather than following the myths created by the victors of the war. As far as the British are concerned, one can see some sort of movement. The story was already written in general about 20 years ago by some Brit Referring to Count Tolstoy? Yes, Tolstoy uh, it was, it was amongst them. And so the facts became known. Uh, but the British government, uh, even today, uh, does not admit that they sent them back. We did actually write to Tony Blair and suggesting that he makes a gesture of regret to Slovenia um, for, uh, uh, for, for having sent the Domobranci back to their deaths. An apology? I wouldn't put it as an apology because I don't think that uh, governments today or our generations need to take responsibility for what people did in past generations. I think we need to show what values we stand for today. And I think that some gesture of regret, which is, could be symbolical, um, is, is appropriate. And, and then one can have closure and the episode is finished. I, I think that actually the present Prime Minister of Slovenia, Jan Cha, his father was a Doma Branitz who was sent back by the British. This, his father just escaped because he was, he was underage. But I think, well, Tony Blair shakes hands with Jan Cha and what does he ask? How is your father? How is your family? What does Jan Cha supposed to reply? It's time to, to, to put this to, uh, to a closure. And I think that uh, we did actually get a, a reply from the Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw, which was quite significant. He wrote in quite sympathetic tones about our book. And he said, it is quite right that we should look at the history again and at the tragedy which befell the Slovenes. Well, that's all put in a positive way, and I'm sure he meant it well. But was it a tragedy which just happened to the Slovenes? Can't the British actually say, we sent them back and it was a mistake and we, we regret it? That's all that one needs to say today. Well, that was much, much more and much better than what uh, became of uh, Count Nikolai Tolstoy. He was sued by one of the generals he mentioned. I think it was yes. 
his name was Toby Law or something. Yes. Mm. Well, he, he was supposed to be the guy who gave the order. Mm. Well, uh, Tolstoy accused him of being a war criminal. And of course, that's he used that term. Yes, and, no, 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 no. Uh, and this is quite strong language. Um, this uh, you wouldn't go to so far. Uh, with no, I wouldn't. No, um, I. It, and this general is now dead. So, as far as we're concerned, this is this is oh. the past. Mm -hmm. I think that you can see in Britain also things have moved on a bit in the sense that um, we are we are circulating. One of the members of Parliament in in uh, in London is circulating amongst other members of Parliament a petition. Uh, obtaining signatures that Britain should make a gesture of regret. And so far this has received nearly 50 signatures. Whether it will go uh, all the way and that uh, it, something will happen, I don't know. But it does show that also in Britain people start to think of things a bit more uh, honestly than in the past. Mm -hmm. Do you know what happened to Tolstoy later? He was sentenced to pay in some enormous mm. amount of money, mm. millions of pounds, mm. for slander to pay to, I don't know, to, to General mm. Law. But he could not pay that, sadly. No. He may be a count, but he, has, he doesn't have the money. So what happened then? Was it... Uh, well, there were various appeals. And yeah, uh, pardoned? Uh, and no, uh, he wasn't. And I understand that he did make a payment, but a very s small p payment, nothing like the one and a half million pounds to which yes. he was sentenced. And, uh, and then that was the end of it. And then the, the general died in any case. And, uh, that was 20 years ago? Uh, the, yes, uh, well, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. At that time, the British establishment was not ready to admit that they had mm. made a mistake. Right? No, I think that uh, one can see that uh, after the war, um, the people who had done things in the war and had won the war, they were the people in power too. And they tended to oh, they were the same, decide yeah. Uh, how history was written. I mean, it was like that in Britain, but look at Slovenia. I mean, the same thing happened there too. The people who won wrote the history, and not all of it was correct. Yes. Mr. Grosselis, uh, it is now about 60 years from those things, and now you come out with, with the book. What took you so long to write? <laughs> um, um, three children uh, <laughs> to see through university. Uh -huh. um, a job to do. I had to earn a living. Yes. Uh, um, being an author, uh, in my experience so far, is not a very paying proposition. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have a story in the book that after approximately 30 years from those uh, mm. events, you had a meeting with a student, you had a, a language school at that time? Yes. And that brought back all, the, all those yes. memories. It, it was a, um, a, a very moving occasion. Uh, I was uh, sitting in my study, this is a, a school in Cambridge, um, and the student uh, asked my advice um, about, uh, about study. It was clear that he, he couldn't afford the fees of the school I was running, um, but uh, might be able to take a, a part-time job um, and uh, att attend a cheaper language school. Um, but for that, he'd need to have permission on his passport to work. So I asked him to show me the passport. There it was with uh, an unmistakably Slovene names, and it was an Argentinian passport. Think of a shiver went down my spine. Um, my, my past suddenly looked at me again. Uh, it, was, it was an extraordinary experience. Naturally, I, I invited him home. Uh, why didn't you come home for supper? Uh, you might meet my wife. I forget whether my son, one of my sons was there too or not. But anyhow, um, and um, before or after the meal, I climbed into the loft. Um, and found a, a big pack, uh, bo cardboard box of papers, uh, my then archives, uh, largely letters I'd written my mother. Uh, um, I'd come to an agreement with her. I tried to read. I tried to write to her more frequently and more fully. If she would keep my letters, so they'd also serve as a diary. And I had this c complete record. And um, um, I was asked to, 
transcribe these. So I sat down in the evenings and weekends. To Slovenian, in, into Slovenian? Yes. No, this is... I know, just transcribe it. To transcribe into English. Uh, I copy them. Uh, this is before the days of word, word processors. So it was with um, um, multiple carbon copies and, and sent a, sent of, a set of them to, to Argentina, where the majority of the uh, Slovenian refugees settled. And, and they, um, a very patient and courageous lady uh, translated the lot uh, into, into Slovene, and it was published there. To uh, Iris Murdoch, uh, who uh, a well-known writer, one of our lead, leading yes. writers of the time. Uh, she had happened to work a fairly short time um, at the Camping Graz uh, for, for predominantly Slovene university students. And um, uh, um, so we, th we thought that uh, the, the letters uh, uh, could interest her. And um, she wrote back, yes, these letters should be published, but uh, to make a, a book of it that one could publish, you need a lot more material. So I, I got a, a, a grants uh, from a couple of trusts, Quaker trusts, um, and um, uh, with the money, um, visited America and Canada, and later also Argentina, uh, with a, a tape recorder, and to make interviews with yes, people. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Well, where does uh, Mr. Ferrar come in into this story? Um, I, I produced a book. Um, I, I, I thought it was quite a good book. But uh, um, the publishers had second thoughts and said, no, uh, we, 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 we won't, we, we'll lose on this book. We, 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 uh, there. So um, uh, I, I got the advice from uh, um, a very experienced publisher. Um, who said, go and find a sympathetic journalist. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I took possibly a year or two trying one, looking two... For him. Looking for him. Looking for him. Several of them um, you know, we, we explored, but no. It, 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 they weren't interested. Yes, they, they were p quite happy to do a, a, a version for television or radio. But yeah. a, a book, I wanted a book. <laughs> and uh, eventually, um, um, my angel was found. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what was your first reaction when you came into contact with that material? Well, um, for, for me, I immediately saw that this was a fantastic story. You already yeah. had some experience of the East, yes, the socialist I, countries. That's I mean. right, yes. I was a foreign correspondent for Reuters uh, for three years in a number of uh, socialist countries in East Berlin and in uh, Prague after the Soviet invasion. And I traveled in nearly all of them, not so much in Yugoslavia, but I, I did sort of understand a little bit of the mentality of the Slavs and also the communist outlook on society and, and, and politics. Yes. So I was attracted to this story uh, for that reason, but also as, as, a, as a human story, because I could see that this was a story about human beings who'd gone through terrible catastrophes and had picked themselves up. They'd had to leave and go on a long journey and live in a foreign country, and just when they thought they were self safe, an even worse catastrophe happened when the Doma Branci were sent back. And then some of them came back and made successful lives. People like Bayouk, who was prime minister here, and uh, Rode, and, uh, and uh, a number of others who came back uh, to Slovenia. Others stayed and made successful lives elsewhere. And I found that as I went to talk with these people, sometimes I'd walk in at the, at the front door and I had to have a piece of paper in my hand ready to start writing down because they started telling their stories straight away and they were the most fantastic stories. If I had invented this as fiction, nobody would believe me. But this is real history and it's, it's a moving human, human story. And these are the, the stories in the book? That's right, yes. yes. Mm. Uh, there is also a, a thing we should talk about. While the, the civilians were staying in mm. uh, Corinthia, there were pressures from the British military, from the United Nations refugee, the UNRWA, mm. 
and from the Yugoslav government for them to get them back mm -hmm. to voluntarily. Yes. C correct. But they didn't like to do that, did they? No. Some did. What happened to those who did? Oh, come the, back? Um, uh, a number did. Um, 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 some suffered severely uh, when they returned. Um, others, um, I mean, in the case of, um, for instance, um, Dr. Gantar, who was one of the um, uh, leading teachers in the uh, Begunska Gymnasia uh, in, in the camp, um, uh, he, I think, returned. He had strong family reasons, I believe, for doing so. Um, and um, um, I think he, he made a, a, a distinguished career here back home. But that was, I think, fairly exceptional. Mm -hmm. There was also uh, some demands from the Yugoslav side that those among the refugees who were war criminals or something mm -hmm. should be uh, S uh, should be sent back by force if necessary. Oh, certainly. Yeah, there and there were some, some questions, mm. some interrogations about that. Uh, 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 very much so. Um, because the British wanted them back too, wasn't it? No, 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 no that, that, is, that is not the case. No, no uh, by that time, the, the British, I think, were aware that uh, uh, Yugosla Yugoslavia um, under President Tito, particularly those first three years, was a full Stalinist uh, uh, totalitarian state um, and had no doubts about um, the justice system. So that only if there was a, a, a strong uh, uh, and quite clear prima facie case uh, w would they uh, agree to a false poor repatriation. Mm -hmm. and, um, I was involved uh, in, in one case. I had by this, this time in 1947 uh, returned to England to continue my law studies uh, and um, had a, a pathetic letter um, for, from um, uh, a student uh, who, who I knew well, um, Maria Janjar, uh, telling me that her husband uh, had been um, arrested. I think he was handcuffed and taken off to a, a, a camp where otherwise uh, were be held um, uh, mainly former members of the SS. Um, and um, uh, that the th was, was, was threatened with being sent back uh, uh, to Slovenia. Um, uh, uh, luckily, w w we knew our our local member of parliament well, so I uh, wrote to him at once. Members of parliament are entitled to approach uh, ministers uh, um, uh, in such human uh, uh, interest cases um, and, and receive an answer um, from the minister. Um, and um, he at, wa at once was told that only if there were quite clear evidence um, of war crimes was uh, any question of him being sent back. And then a couple of months later, yes, we've d done the investigations. The, the, uh, um, the, um, we do not accept mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, the, 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 the accusations um, uh, from the Yugoslav government. Um, I mean, it, is, it was clearly a put-up job. Uh, they, they had it... Uh, um, uh, they had a, a strong hostility to Jancha because he was um, the leading student representative. Um, and and, and they, as a, a form of revenge, they wanted to get, to get rid of him. Um, but he and his wife were quite understandably so frightened by this uh, um, that they um, broke off their studies. They, he only had another year to go in mm. Graz, and he was qualified as a doctor. So, so, so they, uh, but in fact, they, they um, decided to, to emigrate. Yeah. Uh, uh, curiously, they chose to emigrate not to America or to Canada. Uh, he, he, he became uh, one of our leading 
uh, a, a psychiatrist, had a, a most distinguished career, and, and made a major contribution to his specialized field in, in, in psychiatry. Uh, when you made those, those 60 or 70 interviews, mm -hmm. what did you find that mostly those people were bitter, or have they forgotten? Did they want to forget? Um, so many years after that, how were they? Uh, psychologically. Uh, yes, uh, um, I'm sure that the Marcus will have a lot to say about this. A couple of, po couple of points. Um, one, determinedly bitter. Uh, he was uh, a son of one of the people I'd worked with most closely in the camp. And, I had, uh, and also, um, I've, I've stayed with his, uh, his sister uh, um, in America. He um, Perfectly frank, for him, uh, the only good Englishman was a dead Englishman. He, had, he, was, uh, he just could not stand us. Um, the other extreme, um, those, some of those who had spent their childhood in the camp said, these were the happiest days of our lives. Um, um, me repeatedly one had most moving accounts of their, their memories of, of the, uh, the, the Boy Scouts movement I in the camp. This was started by uh, an enthusiastic British military officer who was part of uh, uh, the administration running the camp. Uh, and it was enormously successful. And, th and they arranged um, a a summer camp in particular, up, up in a, uh, mm -hmm. a lake above the camp. Uh, and and they, they had a lovely time there. Uh, okay. So what was your uh, experience? Well, <coughs> I think that uh, I found that these people were mostly not as bitter as one, one might expect. But of course many of them wanted to justify their their lives, and understandably so. What I felt strongest was um, a, s a, a desire to be recognized as, as human beings uh, who had played a role in, in history. And uh, they wanted to have, uh, to be heard. And they wanted to make some sense out of their own lives. And also, in the end, I think they wished to be accepted as part of the Slovene people, with all that that means, with respect and with rights, and not to be excluded. And for many years, they were just totally excluded and said, you're traitors, you don't even really count. You, mm. you Slovenes over there, you don't even speak the Slovene language anymore, which was ridiculous. Half of them were going, sending their children to schools and every Saturday morning to precisely le keep learning the, the Slovene language. And uh, I think, you know, we thought about this very carefully. And obviously, one can have different opinions about the rights and wrongs of, of, of what these people do but, and, and did. But... You know, at, at the end of the day, it seems really unfair to exclude these people and say these are not Slovenes. This is part of what uh, Slovenia did. They did it for their, Slovenes did, they did it for their, for their reasons, which when you listen to them, it starts making you, you think and uh, avoiding the, the easy judgments. And in some cases, you know, you can see it, one feels quite clear sympathy for what they're doing. Not always, but... Um, uh, and in that sense, uh, I feel that by going and talking with them, they felt that they were being uh, included a bit more in as normal human human beings, and they wanted to they wanted to, to make that felt, and uh, that was the strongest feeling which I had. Mm. So in, in a way, that the circle came full. The British first divided them, and then they brought them back again through through you too, because you gave mm. them the feeling that yes. they are not left alone and forgotten. Mm. Yes, I, it's rather surprising. That certain amount of chance. But um, I think but, but what both John and I share is this feeling of great compassion and a wish to put things a bit right, to look into it and to do what we can to contribute to a juster and uh, more open uh, view of history with all the rights and wrongs and not trying to that just see it as something where one size 
tries to justify itself against the other side and uses history as a weapon to, to fight against each other. We, this is what we share, this view that we seek conciliation, if possible, some, somewhere down the road, and a sympathetic view of what human beings on this side and that side tried to do under very difficult circumstances. They did their best. Maybe they sometimes did things wrong, but they, they did their best uh, in, in, in a war, and it was terrible. You find in the book that the Slovenes are still a divided nation. The con reconciliation yes. has not been yes. done yet. Yes. As it has been uh, with many other uh, former socialist states. You know the, the scene, you were there, to take Hungary, uh, to yeah. the Czech Republic and so on. Slovenia stands out in that, in that uh, Yes, uh, and that's, that's surprising because Slovenia is uh, in many respects so advanced. It's an exemplary member of the European Union in so far as carrying out all the various rules of the uh, European Union. That it's a democracy, it's a market economy. Uh, but it, it's strange that um, the, the uh, effects of communism in Slovenia have lasted longer. And I think this is because uh, in other countries of Eastern Europe, Communism often meant uh, foreign occupation, that is, by the, by the Soviets. Whilst in Slovenia, it was the opposite. Communism was linked to national liberation. And so the communists were not really always truthful by any means about, uh, about the facts. And that was just part of their doctrine. This was how, how they behaved, and they were not ashamed of it. And, um, but in that way, the history of uh, Slovenia got uh, somewhat distorted because it got mixed up with communist doctrine. You also had interviews with some Yugoslav uh, leaders, I think, with, with Mr. Kuchan. Mm, mm. After what you heard, what he had to say, did you change? Did it change the picture you had, or? Oh yes, it did. What? Um, because uh, I think it was important that we were able to go and talk with people uh, from the other side. And of course, Milan Kuchan is from the other side. His, he is a son of a slain resistance fighter. Um, who lost his life. He never knew his father uh, because he was killed during the war. And um, he is also a, a, a communist. And I realized that, you know, when somebody has been believing something for all their life, you, it's very difficult to suddenly change. And uh, try as he did to be the president of all, um, of all Stobines, I think that the, the fact that he was a son of a slain resistance fighter and the fact that he was also a lifelong communist made it very difficult for him to really position himself in the middle and, and bring people together. But what really struck with me with him was the passion with which he talked about this. This was obviously something which had been on his mind and on his heart uh, for all his life. And uh, I interviewed him in his uh, presidential palace when he was still president. And obviously he had a very busy uh, schedule, but he took time out to speak with me for one and a half hours. And I scarcely needed to ask him any questions because he spoke a monologue for one and a half hours. And uh, it was extremely interesting and moving to hear his heart pouring out uh, about these matters. So you understood the other side of the coin yes. too? We, we certainly did try to, uh, because uh, you know, we feel there's no point in just, uh, we didn't want to be partial and objective. That's not in, certainly my tradition as a journalist of Reuters, this is what I was trained to do for 18 years. And uh, we felt as outsiders, uh, we, we're neither of us um, have an axe to grind politically. Um, we're not Catholic ourselves, uh, and uh, we felt well. The best thing to do is to look at it um, is to look at it objectively. And indeed, our uh, British publishers insisted that we do that. They wanted to have something which was balanced, even if it was mainly telling the story of one, just one particular part of the, of the history. They wanted to put it in a balanced historical context, and that's what we tried to do. Right. Mr. Corsaris already told us his favourite episode, his favorite story. What is the, the episode you remember most as most moving? Well, I think this is this Maria Riba, who John uh, mentioned, because I went to interview her in Bristol when she was an old lady over 80. This is the, uh, the Yancher story? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it, it's, uh, I, what struck me is that uh, the way it started, because she was uh, in May 1945, she was 23 years old, and she was having her birthday tea, and she'd invited her fiancé, Yoje. And uh, Yoje came cycling up, 
and he said, I can't stay for the birthday tea, I'm on a blacklist, I have to go now. And he said, do you want to come with me? And she looked at him and said, yes, I'm coming with you. And she got on her bicycle, they put rucksacks on, and they cycled over the Lubro Pass, and neither of them ever came back to live in their own, in, in their own country. And I think that this has, this is, it's like a fairy story, because uh, when they were in the camps, they married, and she said, we got drunk on coffee. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the, um, uh, and the, uh, the, the camp leader, Valentine Merchol, gave her uh, 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 a pen as, as a wedding present. And then uh, they, uh, they moved eventually and emigrated to England, and her husband became a distinguished uh, specialist. And uh, they brought up two children. Uh, the two children, to begin with, didn't really want to know very much about this. They wanted to be British children like all the other children in school. But when they grew up, they, they became more interested about this. And she said, when I started telling them what really happened to us, they said, we can't believe this. We can't believe that this really happened to you. And um, in, 90, in the year 2000, her husband, uh, Yoje, died. And she held up this pen and says, I'm now just left with this pen. But in that year of her 80th birthday, she went back with her two grown-up children to celebrate her 80th birthday in Slovenia. And she died. She came to the launch of our book in, in London in October 2005. And two months ago, she died. That's her, her full circle. This program with that. Mr. Ferrar, thank you. Mr. Kosele, thank you very much for this talk. Thank, thank you. Spoštovani gledalci, tudi vam hvala, da ste bili z nami in nasvidenje.